So we'll just take uh, two minutes of self-connection, which is just feeling a little self-empathy, feeling into our bodies. So I'm pressing the button, okay? Okay, two minutes. Self-connection. Okay. Coming back into the group. The future setting, uh, having it finished with a chime would be better. <laughs> <laughs> nice, gentle thing. <laughs> that was the best. So let's uh, check in, just, uh, you know, share how you're doing now or just anything you want to talk about, you know, what you're up to, give a minute or two for each person. So did you want to start, Stefan? Since Sure. I'm... Uh, Feeling uh, I don't know. Is this is this where I begin my hand gestures? Is where whatever you want. Yeah. So I'm feeling calm, calm, cool, and collected. <laughs> Anything you want to say about what you're up to? You know, you're just back on from vacation, or um, well, uh, I've uh, you know, I had I had a very I had. I had a very busy day-to-day, uh, -to -day, uh, as usual, Monday, and uh, it's very hot here in New York City, and uh, the emergency room is, uh, you know, it's overfilled with uh, patients, and uh, just did a walkthrough and trying to figure out how we're going to manage, you know, hundreds of patients piling in, you know, the, the corridors are, pile, are, are filled with stretchers. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's wild. So it's an average day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Mimi? I could say that I feel very calm and I mean like Stefan described it like this. Not the, the line of the dead person, of course, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of, you know, there is a little wave. And uh, um, this is a vacation time for me. I have two, two weeks off. I gave myself two weeks off once I'm self-employed. And uh, I haven't done this for years. And uh, I'm going to use the time for uh, self-reflection. And I'm going to plan the next steps. And I just want... Uh, time for introspection and just I want to think and you know just um, uh, look back look at the future mainly and just make the next plan so I feel very delighted that I have this time I'm gonna have this time with myself and some other people and yes very happy 
Okay, Ingrid, do you want to? Um, I just got back from vacation for oh. just a few few days. Went to Napa in California, and um, oh. I had even toyed with the idea of going to Berkeley uh -huh. to see what you guys were doing, but decided not to do that. Sure. But um, and then we got back, and um, my daughter's here with eight-year-old grandson, and then we leave town again. So. I kind of get this um, and it, and it, so it symbolizes what's going on for me right now too, is I have to leave at one thirty, So I'm calm. And then all of a sudden my memory recalls that I have to leave. So I have to look at the watch. So I kind of spike and then I come back down and then I'm calm. And then I remember, Oh, what time is it? And I have to look up again and come back down. <laughs> So it's calm. I don't know how else to describe it. Okay, then I'll go. The uh, yesterday we had the empathy tent at a demonstration. There was a right wing uh, demonstration in Berkeley, and then the counter demonstration. So we had the empathy tent group there, you know, doing all the stuff that we do, and yeah, I had a lot of fun. I always uh, enjoy these. They're events. They're. Uh, at the end, we were all feeling kind of tired, you know, towards the afternoon, but the rest of the demonstrators kept going, screaming and yelling at each other till, you know, late in the afternoon. Uh, I feel kind of focused, kind of, kind of like, <laughs> you know, it's like work mode. <laughs> oh my God, how do you do that? <laughs> I don't know. It's, Oh, wait, I'm not like dealing with all the patients that you are. So I think it's, uh, you know, I have more energy. Just got up and here I am it's still morning, you know, so or it's noon now. Can you tell us a little bit about um, like what happened uh, at this particular empathy tent? Like what, what do you feel like, were there any outcomes? Uh, any, what, how did it, did anything change? Oh yeah. Well, we, you know, we offer listening and uh, the, uh, they, it was in the park in Berkeley, and they didn't allow us to have the empathy tent in there uh, because they weren't allowing anything metal. So actually, I can just give a quick slide show here of the... So we set up, there was a, the peace wall there. We hung the empathy tent and our dialogue sign up there, and we set up kind of in front and... Uh, it has a little sign, Empathy Circle. So we did a couple of Empathy Circles, which I'll report on. And, you know, there was the police there, and I wandered around with the sign, I support em a culture of empathy. And then I would ask people, do you support a culture of empathy? And they'd say, what does that mean? And I, on the other side of the sign, it gives an explanation. You know, it means uh, mutual listening, you know, constructive dialogue, collaborative action, seeing our common humanity. So I would show people that this was one of our team members, you know, he was holding up the signs to, you know, we kind of go around between the people. And then I asked, I would say, do you support a culture of empathy? And they'd say, yeah, well, what does that mean? I talked to him and then they'd say, yeah, I support a culture of empathy. And then I'd say, uh, would you hold up the sign? Can I get a picture of you? So. This is actually a reporter for InfoWars. I don't know if you know who InfoWars is, but they're really, really, you know, extreme, you know, right wing, right wing group. And she's a reporter and she said, yeah, I support a culture of empathy. So she's kind of well known too uh, in, in all these demonstrations. So I thought that was kind of, and then this is actually the right wing organizer who organized the right wing event, Amber Cummings. And the Berkeley, they all, you know, not everybody, just there's, he's like, you know, in public enemy number one. And I talked to her and says, I support a culture of empathy. <laughs> 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 you know, and then this is the, the communist. There's a, you know, revolutionary bookstore and there's a, she, she works there. And so she's the other side who's sort of the communists, you know, they're, they're calling the other side fascists and the other side calls them communists. And, and I, I talked to her and she says, I support a culture of empathy. <laughs> so you got both sides saying they support a culture of empathy or someone from there. 
And that's one of our team members, you know, holding up the sign, Stephanie. She's been to a lot of the meetings. And here's a reporter. He was a reporter from magazine, uh, from newspaper, Oakland Tribune. He said he supported a culture of empathy. And we held empathy circles, you know, out on the lawn. So I did several circles, some more of our team members. And this got in the local paper. It says empathy team facilitates dialogue. So Amber, the so-called rightist, and then a communist having a dialogue in our, you know, Dave kind of holding presence there. And, and uh, so that was, and, you know, we went with the signs, you know, in the scrum in the middle of the screaming and yelling, you don't really cap get too much of a sense of it, but, uh, there are some videos on the website, you know, that kind of show what we did. So that was it. You know, we're just trying to develop a toolkit of different activities. What was very popular was I have a little box that is free empathy kisses. And I go and hand those out. And I can actually show that real quick here. So there's a little box that says, empathy kisses, you talk, we listen. There's a bunch of Hershey's kiss, you know, chocolate kisses. <laughs> and then we have the business card there that says free empathy and, you know, empathy tent. And we hand that out and, you know, I just walk through the crowds and give that out and, you know, talk to people and keep advocating for a culture of empathy and try to de-escalate. And so, you know, keep developing process we offer listening to people and so yeah that's the can i ask a few things sure uh why were the policemen there uh they were to keep the crowd separated because fights would always start you know fist fights and why okay why was the crowd gathered what was the reason the uh political right came out to demonstrate they want free speech and they're going to berkeley which is one of the most liberal cities in the country and then okay. the, the citizens come out and they're angry that these people come and they think they're fascists. So they come out to demonstrate. And some of the most, you know, farthest right wing that the anarchists, the Antifa, and uh, the communists come out to uh, counter demonstrate. And then the demonstrations come together and they get in, you know, literal fist fights and Sometimes the uh, police have to do tear gas and stuff to separate the people or there was okay. ten, 10 arrests, 10 people got arrested for having weapons and stuff. So um, you said that you talked to this and this and this uh, people and they decided to hold this uh, poster and go for empathy. Um, how long did it take you to explain to these people what empathy is and uh, had they uh, had they heard about it before? Were they aware of the content of this term? Do they know what empathy? Uh, yeah, people pretty much know what empathy is. A lot of times they think it's sympathy or you know other terms. And uh, I would talk to people anywhere from five minutes to 15, 20 minutes. There was there was one guy that really didn't trust what we were doing in the empathy tent, and he's just very aggressive. He's always in the face. He's on the right wing. And he says, you're just in the empathy tent trying to lure people in, you know, and, and then once you- To do you, what? I don't know, to, to, do, to do bad things to them, to, you know, deceive mm -hmm. them. And and uh, and then he was making the case and, I, and then I would empathize with him. And it was actually a woman there who I had been talking to. She works in the prisons, you know, helping prisoners tell their stories so that they can, when they go to the parole board, that they can, share their personal story and then i listened to this guy for like 15 20 minutes doing empathic listening he's attacking 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 me you know in the empathy tent and i just reflect back i reflect back i reflect back i reflect back and at the end she says i can't believe how good you are <laughs> so the only thing you did was just to do. reflect as we do, this is what you did. I mean, for example, he was accusing you or he was just uh, using calling names or I don't know how aggressive the person was and the only thing you did was the practice we do here? Yeah, it's the core of it. 
I then, and then I then a couple of times asked him to reflect what I said. So at first I said, so what I'm hearing is you really don't trust what we're doing. You think that we're just trying to lure people in so that we can do some damage or harm to them. Is that correct? And then he said, he'd say some more and I would reflect that back. Okay, okay. And then, okay. but then I would say, now this is my point. And then I would say my point and he wouldn't really listen. I said, okay, would you listen back and reflect back what I'm saying to you? And then he would do it. And, and I kind of... Oh, okay, but if he was aggressive, why he, he agreed on listening to you and reflecting back? He would say, who cares about you? I mean, get out of my way. I don't want to talk to you. I don't understand why aggressive person and negative wanted to, uh, to join you and try this empathic listening thing. Yeah, you and then I would just say, so what I'm hearing is you really want me to get out of the way. You don't want to see me. You're just like totally uninterested in talking to me. Is that what you're saying? Am I hearing you correctly? You know, I really want to understand what you have to say. Says, get the fuck out of here. Do you really want me to get the fuck out of here? Tell me more. You know? <laughs> okay, wow. not very good. <laughs> and then, then I would say, well, I'd really like to hear what you're understanding. Can you just let me know what you heard me say? So you really want to hear what I'm, what I'm saying. So it, it's a whole sort of uh, empathic dance. And, and then at the end, and then he was like criticizing and then saying that we were trying to lure some people in. And, and oh, and then my partner came by and said, we did not do this. And then he said, and he actually said, oh, I stand corrected. If I'm wrong about this, he thought we had lured somebody in for negative. And then we explained the situation. And then he said, oh, I'm sorry. And he shook our hands. So he shook our hands. And then when it was all over, we shook hands. And I said, can I give you a hug, too? And he says, oh, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'm going to have to go. Okay. I got to oh, sign okay. off. Take care. We'll Bye. see you. Okay. Have a good vacation. Okay. See you Thank next you. week. Right, we're on for next week, right? So, yeah, bye. okay. Yep. So. Uh, then when you gave these people the little chocolate things, uh, okay, they took it and did you give them the chance to talk about anything? I give them a card that's free, says free empathy. Because I was going, there was a lot of fights going on. So I was going around the circling around the fights, giving people. What I found is people around the sides we're more willing to do choc take chocolates because they're getting tired and hungry. But the closer you get to the fight, people are just like fixated on the fight and they didn't want the chocolate so much. So well, what I'd like to do is have strategies where we have a big sign that says a culture of empathy. And then we just kind of walk into the middle of the fight, you know, and say, oh, what do you guys think about empathy? <laughs> So, so. Uh, what was their reaction? Did we didn't, I didn't do that. I did a little bit oh. of it, but just holding the sign. I had a little that little sign, but I think we need a bigger one. That so. Okay. Well, I think it's, I think it's nice. Sir. So what, Stefan? So. I, think it's, I think it's nice to um, work the edge, uh, and uh, as you get the edge uh, to come off. Yeah. Uh, then, that, then that core feels less. Um, you know, uh, surrounded, defended, and then you can break away at the core. But that, that's yeah, not... you've seen that energy kind of happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so did uh, did any new members, any any new people, uh, try to contact you, become members? <laughs> did I mean after this event, what was the real outcome for the culture of empathy? Um. How did this contribute to your effort to make it bigger and wider and more popular? Uh, well, one person said they want to join us. We have a meeting on Wednesday and he'll be joining us there. And we got in the media, we got in the newspaper and, you know, that picture of the mediator. And we made connections with a lot of people. People are getting to know us. We got talked to InfoWars. You know, InfoWars was videotaping us and... Big deal. Oh. Yeah. So, and they're the there's a they're a big group. So, um, but I want to get started with our listening, so we can do kind of the mutual listening. Uh, so we just step into empathic listening, so it can be on what is your report from doing a facilitating an empathy circle, or or about the chapter, or whatever is alive in you. So, shall we start with that? And you haven't had a chance to speak much, Stefan. If you want to start. Okay, so um, my. Um, and who are you speaking my, to? 
I'm, uh, I'm speaking to uh, Dimitra. Um, so oh, you pronounced my name perfectly. Can you say that again? <laughs> oh my goodness, can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Dimitra, okay. you said Dimitra. Wow, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, had my cousin in town for about a week and um, um, I took them, I, I, I paid for him to come to visit me. He's 24 and his friend and um, I took them out to the beach um, on, uh, anyway, we had a really good time and uh, uh, we kind of did, a, did an empathy circle uh, about their, uh, you know, their, their vacation and stuff. And, um, and um, some really deep things came out of it, um, personal things from my, my cousin. Uh, so it, it was a um, it was a good experience, and I don't think they had ever had anything like that before. Okay, so it seems that you are very satisfied and delighted because you had the chance to practice empathic listening with your cousin that uh, visited you the last week, and you had the chance to spend time together visiting some fancy place like the beach, and you are very. Um, happy that you had this deep discussion probably he never had anything similar like this and anything similar in the past mm -hmm. yes I feel her <laughs> oh, is that all <laughs> all right uh, okay um, then uh, I can talk to Edwin okay I say that I tried the empathic listening and in Greek language, there is a problem. The word empathy is connected to a Greek word uh, that is pronounced like empathia. Okay, for an American citizen, this is not very well connected, but for Greek, a Greek ear, it is. So people uh, uh, misunderstand the meaning. Empathia in Greek language means that I envy you, envy. So it has absolute uh, negative meaning. And I had uh, a little difficult time to explain to people how to uh, discriminate, how, sorry, how to distinguish the difference between these two terms, the em empathy in English and empathia in Greek language. I guess you, were, you had a little trouble with, uh, with doing the empathy circle with, in terms of the, the words, like there's uh, a word empath, empathia, in Greek, that means to envy someone, and then there, so it's so similar to the word empathy that it was like difficult in distinguishing the two terms and the differences of meaning between the two. So it was a bit of a struggle, it sounds like. Exactly, and uh, however, I gave the chance when I had groups of two people, I gave them the chance to ask questions, I gave a topic. Uh, and I asked, or I asked them to make a statement. For example, um, the per one person said, I'm very meticulous. And the other person uh, started asking questions about the meaning of this term. Meticulous doing what and when, and how often, and blah, blah. But you know what? I realized that people have a hard time to ask questions and a hard time to understand the answer to the question. I mean, to interpret the meaning. Um, uh, the speaker gives to the term they couldn't um, that was what the, my sample gave me of course I'm not talking for the whole humanity but the sample I had seemed to have a hard time doing this mm -hmm. so you were using uh, a question that uh, I was a little unclear like the speaker would give a question or you gave a question and there was difficulty that in terms of understanding what the question meant uh, uh, there, were, there were two people, and the mm -hmm. first uh, student said, I am very meticulous as a person. Oh. And the other student should ask questions to the first student, trying to uh, understand how the first uh, interlocutor means that. I mean, meticulous, what do you mean by that? Oh, when you tidy, uh -huh. when you, uh, tidy your room, in what sense? So the, the second student asked the questions to the first student who made the statement. But they had a hard time to come up with the right questions 
and a hard time to interpret the answers of the first person. The, the second person, the one who asked the question, couldn't really understand what the, the first speaker meant. Mm -hmm. So you were using the exercise, one of the exercises from the book yes. where the person says, something you need to know about me is I am you know, meticulous or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And then those people were having trouble with uh, asking the questions and understanding the questions. Right. Uh, so, so it was a struggle to kind of do that exercise because it kind of, yeah. I think the struggle is a correct word here. And I think that people have very hard time when they try to communicate because mainly they just want the other person to finish and they want to speak again. And this is a very, very serious problem. And this week I was seriously thinking about that. How, how could I do something to improve the situation? Because I don't want people to end up with misconception and uh, relationships to fail just because they don't know what the other person means. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a struggle because people are always wanting to speak and you're, you're wanting to, uh, you're, you're thinking of how you can address this uh, problem and just sort of sitting with, how do I address this problem? Yes. Thank you. I okay. can fully heard. Okay. Then I'll speak to Stefan. Um, so what's coming to mind is, uh, is uh, for me, me to uh, have just had the flyer maybe translated into Greek to, to do an empathy circle where they, they just do the empathic listening like we're doing here right now is um so you're you're you're, you're trying to be helpful yeah uh to uh Dimitra and and uh and notice and, and you notice that the that something was lost in the translation uh, i think it, she was doing the one of the exercises in the book instead of an empathy circle i mean the empathy circle is where we do the reflective listening i i think if she was i, I was a little confused there if she was wanting to do an empathy circle or if she was wanting to do one of the exercises but I think the thing we're wanting to try, test out, is doing an empathy circle, mutual empathic listening in small groups. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, maybe the instructions, maybe, maybe Dimitri understood the instructions uh, and tried a, uh, an exercise from the book instead of actually doing the empathy circle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but if we were to do the empathy circle, perhaps a, a translation to be uh, better. Yeah. So yeah, I was a little confused about about you know what was really happening, and and so uh, um, so anyway, that's that's what came up for me. I did an we did a couple empathy circles at the at the rally. So we sat when it was still kind of early. We sat on the grass, and then one of the right wing people came, and he sat. He was kind of wandering by, kind of checking out. He's a really big military, ex-military guy. He was kind of like the early, you know, checking things out. And he was walking by. He's like, ah, oh, come on, come on, sit down. And he came and sat on the grass there. And we started doing the empathy circle, showed him how to do it. And he seemed to really, uh, yeah, enjoy it. And at the end, he said, if you need any protection or security, you know, just call on me. <laughs> 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 so I'm ex military, you know. I'm safety is what I do, you know. So you're kind of kind of happy that you had this kind of surprising early adopter uh, uh -huh. uh, who uh you know ended up offering uh his services back to you for what you for what he for whatever positive you know feelings he had toward you uh and toward the interaction in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was kind of positive. And a little bit later, someone who he's, he's Russian and he was just kind of checking out curious and he sat down and we also did it with him. And he, he said, I just like to listen and observe, but he was turned out. He was a very good listener. And then I did some empathic listening with him reflecting and I could feel the connection. Like there was a visceral bodily connection you know when I was listening to him it just felt really good and he seemed to really like the experience and so um, it uh, it was harder to do the circle getting the different size when things start getting heated up it's hard to hold a, a circle you know 
but early in the demonstrations when people are just arriving, we could hold some empathy circles. So it, it sounds like you, you found it uh, easier to do more uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one and, uh, yeah, and, and then early on uh, it was easier. Uh, yeah. But uh, in the thick of it, in the middle, uh, really you weren't really capable of bringing both sides into the empathy tent for back and forth. Yeah, it's so interesting when we're sitting there, you know, doing this empathic listening, you can feel the energy around and something would happen, the fight would kind of start, maybe this yelling, and you just feel the energy get more intensive and everybody goes to where the energy is. So just feeling the energy that when things get intense, and people are drawn like magnets to the intensity of the, of, of the yelling and so it's like it's like uh, you know the the uh, it's like you're com it's like you're competing against uh, this other uh, yeah other other energy energy like a, a contagion uh huh so there's this uh, there so there's like your contagion versus their contagion and their contagion is much more intense and it's yeah. drawing them even from your group over. Yeah, and then there was at uh, one point another group tried to come over, more of the Antifa group, and the police wouldn't allow them into the zone, so they were shooting those flashbangs. So they're like, uh, they're uh, tear gas, and these just they bombs that kind of blow up and they give a concussion and they kind of you know shock people, and so you could hear these flashbangs going boom, 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 and everybody runs over to where the. <laughs> The, the, you know the energy they every I could everybody is going over to that energy it's hard to compete with that yeah. kind of and just noticing the energy that yeah it's just interesting yeah how, how can you how can you how can how can you compete yeah exactly how can we compete so yeah so I feel hurt thank you okay um, <clears throat> So I'm I, I, I'm getting uh, repeated calls from the hospital, so oh. I, may, I may have to uh, ultimately leave because uh, I'm not sure what's going on. But, uh, okay, do you need when to they're, handle they're, those first? When they're, when they're calling me from this number, it means there's something going on. So, um, so um, I'm just wondering about what. Um, so so from from both Demetra and. Uh, Edwin, uh, what I'm hearing are some of the some of the practical uh, applications of empathy, and uh, you know how do we get it out there and uh, spread it in different in different ways? Uh, what kind of communication problems we have? How do we uh, keep people um, involved? Um, one thing I guess uh, is practice makes perfect, and um, you don't uh, start trying uh, to do uh, a skill in the heat of the moment. I think is what I, what I, my my understanding of uh, any kind of skill, uh, because um, if you're trying to do it in the heat, oh, of who are you moment, speaking to? Hey. I'm sorry. Uh, I guess I'll speak to you, Edwin. Sorry. Okay. I, I did I say did I say anyone? No, I didn't say anyone. No. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll stop so there. So you're talking about skill building. How do you learn the skill of, of listening? Because practice makes perfect. You're practicing, and then you want to practice not in the heat of the moment where it's like a very intense. You want the less yeah intense environment to practice in. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure we're giving um, empathy a fair handshake <laughs> um, <clears throat> coming into a, uh, I don't know, coming into the, to the heat of the moment into a, a battle <laughs> of sorts. Uh, I'm not sure, but, but maybe um, these other techniques, empathy kisses and, and cards and uh, uh, 
and maybe early on before the intensity of it starts, like you were mentioning, maybe you can grab a few people who might contact you or, uh, or, and, or have a second thought about it later on, contact you, and then, and then work, try to work with some, of, some, some folks. Uh, and maybe you're going to have to do it one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to have to do it one-on-one -on -one and uh, not, uh, not, not, not expect to have dramatic changes during the event uh, or anything like that. And, you know, just, just expect that that's not going to be the way it's going to work. So you're, you're seeing like an intense environment, like a demonstration might not be the best place for doing it, like these empathy circles. There's other things that could be done to, you know, kind of around that, but not to have too big of expectations uh, and, you know, do the empathy kisses, do just the listening on one-to-one, -one, but necessarily, you know, mutual listening, training and practice might not be the best. That might not be the best environment. Right. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. what I'm hearing yeah so that's just more of a response to what you're hearing and yeah is there more or? um and um you know and then and then the, the struggles that uh Demetra, uh mentioned um about um one using this exercise and seeing that uh she was having a hard time keep, to get people engaged in the exercise and also uh, having some translation issues with the word empathy. Um, the translation stuff, you, you suggest an idea, suggest translating it, and, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I don't know that we could be that helpful with that. I mean, she knows that, you know, that part better than we do. Um, um, and regarding the exercises, um, I, I, I personally kind of found, uh, those exercises, some of those exercises, um, to be a little odd too, and a little difficult. Mm. So relating to Dimitra's, uh, what she was doing, you're just, uh, saying that you found those exercises to be a little odd too and you know there's she probably knows better than we do like how to address the address the, the issues around that around the translation part. around the translations and, yeah. Yeah. and the definitions and things like that yeah. and so you're just responding to what each of us said so what I said you're going to respond and then to what Dimitra is, is saying you want to respond to that yeah I feel her okay um then I'll speak to Dimitra so uh yeah I really enjoyed hearing Stefan's story with his cousin you know that that there's sort of this it sounds like it was a, a, a nice setting and there was a sense of deeper family connection so that's always enjoyable to hear positive stories like that okay it seems that it seems that uh, stefan's story about meeting with his cousin has really touched your heart and you're very delighted whenever you hear that empathy can bring uh, people closer and can uh, make stronger the bond between family members yeah and I'm wondering how he envisions maybe incorporating it into his class or so. I'm kind of curious about that environment too. And we would love to learn more about how Stefan could make empathy part of his classes with his own students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel heard. Thanks. Thank you, Dick. Oh, oh, my turn. Um, okay, so I'll talk to Stefan. Uh, it seems that uh, my description regarding the empathy exercise was not very clear. So, uh, what I what I what I did with my students was to just make a short introduction about what empathy is, and because they understand something totally different when they first hear the word in English, because they they it reminds them of the Greek term, which is absolutely irrelevant 
And then I told them, okay, imagine that you are out for a drink and you are two people. And one of you says, you know, I'm very, I'm a very, I told them, you know, I'm a go-getter. Let's say that one of them tells you, you know what, I'm a go-getter. And so the other person asks questions to the first one so as to clarify what the person means by saying that. So you, um, so you tried out this scenario uh, where uh, you want your class to, you know, try to uh, figure out what, what, what somebody means by some statement. And, and that's one of the, and uh, you wanted to, and, and you wanted to see what would happen. Right. Once it was part of the language class, I wanted them to come up with a question. So, you know, form the right questions in present simple and present perfect and all these things that we do. And also, <laughs> uh, they, yeah, because it's an English class. So they have, you know, they struggle to uh, learn, you know, the syntax and how to form the tenses. And also, uh, it was the social aspect where they tried to understand what the person meant by using this term. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so in this exercise, there was there was practice of the grammar and and practice of also some culture, and uh, it's a nice melding together of you know these two opportunities for your for your class for your students. Right. Yes. And uh, what I have in my mind it was something I heard in the news uh, previous week, and. <clears throat> And it was about Holland, where uh, some women, Muslim women, uh, protested, and they went down to the street, and they were they 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 wanted to they um they wanted uh, to be fully covered, fully covered. Not only their head to be covered, but everything to be covered, uh, except for their eyes. So they protested against the government because the government says that if you want to be fully covered, you're gonna be out. Uh, you're gonna be kicked out of the country. And I was thinking uh, about the situation. And as citizens, where does democracy starts and where democracy stops? Okay. Uh, so you're, uh, so you're seeing, uh, some, some, uh, Muslims who are not, uh, who are wanting to be fully covered and that's not accepted in the, by the Holland government. And, uh, you're wondering, uh, whether the, the, uh, Democracy. Whether, whether the, well, what I'm wondering is what you mean by that. But uh, you're wondering if the, if the uh, desires of the, of the, of the many uh, over the few uh, should be, uh, should be over what uh, the few desire. Right, because democracy started from Athens, as we know, and this means that uh, the majority should. Um, how can I say that, should decide about what is accepted and what is not. But as citizens, as members of a society, we have to understand that my, my freedom stops at the point where your freedom starts, begins. So mm -hmm. I cannot do something just because I want it as long as it annoys you, disturbs you, or is against your own freedom. So you were just uh, having uh, struggles, uh, and, and, and this was somehow connected to you teaching your class? Uh, not yet, but after the August the 20th, when I go back to my classes, might be. <laughs> yeah. I haven't decided yet. I haven't discussed it yet with my students. I guess I didn't understand. No, you didn't? Oh, okay. Uh, so that was a piece of news that was something in the news and it made me think about as citizens where that where does my freedom stops and where your right which is um, that I mean, these people wanted to be fully covered the citizens in holland said that this is inappropriate mm -hmm. other people said this is accepted so i wondered 
how would I respond to a mm. challenge of this kind? Okay. Um, so this is a difficult challenge and, and, uh, and uh, you know, people, people are on both sides and we were wondering, you know, where you, how you would come down on this issue yourself. Right. And I thought that I wanted to send a message to them and say, okay, you want to be fully covered and you claim that this is your right. If I say that tomorrow I go down the street nude, is it my right or not? Because I might say that wearing clothes is a convention and I want to get rid of them. So you want to be fully covered? I want to be nude. Do we have the right to do it? Okay, so by uh, running down the street completely nude, uh, we wonder if that would send them a message about their uh, wanting to be fully covered. Yeah, I mean that we have to respect some rules if we want to be part of the society. That was the, that, that was my, these were my thoughts around this uh, issue. Sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <That's really hard. laughs> All right. Um, well, I'll speak to uh, Edwin. Okay. Um, um, we didn't, we didn't, uh, talk much about the chapter yet, um, and, uh, I, uh, I was having difficulty in the very beginning kind of con uh, connecting. I think, I think it might have been my microwave that was affecting my, <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, uh so, what I understood is that uh, Ingrid and Edwin were going to be meeting through uh, introductory video uh, uh, about what is an empathy circle. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, I've also been having difficulties throughout this whole conversation because um, I can see Edwin's feet moving in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I see you too. <laughs> And I, and I couldn't figure out whose video camera that was. Someone <laughs> had a video camera aimed at the feet. And then, um, I thought someone had a sideshow here that they forgot to tell us all about. <laughs> and I so you're seeing my feet moving. It was confusing. You thought there was like another video camera. Yeah. It's like, what's yeah. going on? And, and you, you, you had audio problems with maybe was your microphone. And so it sounds like a lot of distractions and confusion about what's going on here. Yes, <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> so, feeling some humor about the whole kind of situation. Yeah, especially with your feet moving. Because <laughs> we don't usually see people's feet. <laughs> Yeah, usually we don't see people's feet, you see the upper part of their body, so you're just like wondering what's kind of going on with these feet in the, in the background there. And now I know. <laughs> I feel hurt. Okay. Okay, then uh, I'll speak back to you, um, just to shift things out around a little bit. Uh, so yeah, uh, Ingrid and I are meeting an hour before this meeting to work on the on creating a slideshow and then a video uh, for how an introduction to Empathy Circle. Right now we have the one page in uh, PDF as well as the web page, and we want to expand on that and turn it into a, a, a you know into a little video introduction. So that's a project we're working on. Okay, so um, so yeah, you confirmed mm -hmm. uh, what we're, what uh, I had heard. Yeah, I'm feeling excited about it because I think it's something that's really needed for a lot of uh, situations. I think it'll really help introduce people to the empathy circle. So uh, I've been trying to get this together, and it's been a struggle for some reason. I don't know why, but it's something I'm really trying to zoom in on and focus on getting this together. Great. 
Yeah, and uh, Mimi said she would join us. So we're going to be doing uh, brainstorming about it. And then we're going to test out empathy circles, which so we are all kind of testing out how to actually facilitate an empathy circle. We're kind of doing it here, but it's going out into the wild and you know, facilitating it, gathering insights, experience. So, and then we'll start uh, building or expanding on the introduction to the empathy mm -hmm. circle. And then once we have a good slide deck and it all laid out, then we'll turn that into a little video to, you know, five, 10 minute video introduction. So that's kind of a project that, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, it sounds like you're excited uh, mm -hmm. about uh, all this work has been put into it and yet something, something's been holding you back from putting together this, uh, this project. Yeah. And so uh, now you've got these two eager uh, participants who um, hopefully can help you. Actually, I have to go for a moment. Okay, okay. sure, go, oh, that's okay. Then, yeah, I feel heard, thanks. Hello? If you wanna mute, you could mute. Somebody's going. So, uh, Vivi, do you wanna speak since I just, yeah, okay. Um, I would like to sh share something that happened the previous week. One of my students, Greek students, she lives in London. She's 50 something years old. And she told me about, you know, just a very short um, discussion that shows that people uh, cannot really communicate well. And so she was there at her flat and she rent some rooms and uh, one of the tenants came over and she told him hi how are you today and he answered if i wanted to tell you i would have told you first she was shocked of course after taking this answer and she just continued continued doing whatever she had to do and a few days later the person came back and told her you know what you couldn't ask me that day how how I spend my day at work and she said I'm sorry I just asked you how are you doing I didn't narrow it down that much and she she just shared this with me feeling very disappointed because she said oh my god I mean it's so hard to communicate with people I mean why they get things they make things they make things so complicated and I still have it in my didn't like it. Mm -hmm. You broke up a little bit at the end, but oh. when I was, no, you're, it froze. But what I was hearing is uh, one of your students was sharing a, a, you know, just an experience she's having in terms of the difficulty of communicating where she tried to reach out to someone, tried to ask them, you know, how they were doing. And she got a gruff response and saying, you know, the person didn't really want to say anything. And, and then he came back uh, later at a later time and said, well, you should have asked me this. And, and uh, it was just like, just the kind of difficulty of, of having just a constructive, you know, being able to really connect with someone. It's just the difficulty that can be involved in that. And, and it sounds like it's sitting with you too. Like she told you this story and you're kind of like holding that story and kind of, just, just right. kind of trying to make sense out of it or it's it's affecting you in some way yes right because I, I would definitely like to do something for this I see people being very unhappy uh, deeply alone because they don't know how to connect they it hurts me mm -hmm. I really want to do something for this mm -hmm. so you're noticing that she was feeling alone she was trying to connect but she couldn't connect and so she felt uh, very alone. And you're sensing that aloneness and feeling her aloneness and her struggle affects you too. So you feel affected by that and you wanna contribute in some way. Yeah, I mean, uh, you are very close to this. I mean, mm -hmm. that uh, her story made me think once again that people like this guy feel alone and they don't know oh. how, how to connect with others. They try to connect, but they are emotionally clumsy. And they just, instead of connecting, they disconnect themselves from others. And I, I really want to do something about it because I see examples like this and I hear about examples like this every day. 
And mm-hmm. I'm really concerned about that. So it, it wasn't that she was feeling lonely. It was that you think that he was feeling lonely and he was being awkward in how he kind of responded and how he tries to, how, how he connects. And you see this happen all the time, this sort of, this people not knowing how to, uh, to connect with people and how to, how to dialogue with people and to connect with each other. And that's what causes you some concern or some pain is just seeing how these people are not able to uh, connect. Yes, definitely. And um, uh, what I want to say, yeah, I definitely want to do something about it. And uh, I think that we have, to, we have to start from naming our own feelings. I should mm. know how I feel first. I feel this. I feel that, for example, Edwin makes me feel this. And I want to communicate this to you. And I want to say, hey, you know what? What if you try not to talk to me in this way because I feel like this? And you should be willing enough to hear me, to listen to my request and uh, try to fix it if we are friends or if you are a friendly person. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it, you, you, the communication starts with feelings, being able to identify and express your feelings. So if you're with a friend, you want to be able to uh, feel free to share your feelings uh, with the other person and say, oh, when you say this, or when you do this, this is the feelings that arise in me, and be able to share those those feelings, and that's kind of part of uh, a deeper connection, having a deeper connection, is to be able to share those feelings. Right, and what I'm seriously thinking about is how I'm gonna transform and transfer what we did together in Greece because the cultural parameter is very serious and I have this obstacle here. I mean, I'm not going to stay with the obstacle in front of me. I'm going to go beyond that. But this is a real difficulty for me because I know that my uh, that Greek nationals will think in a different way than you do. It's a cultural difference. So I have to bring about some changes so as to make the material and the activities, um, uh, bring them closer to their way of thinking. Uh, so I want, find, I want them to embrace it. Uh, so there's going to be uh, Greek nationals and there's different groups are going to have different ways of thinking or being and you're wanting to be able to address them so you can uh, connect with them as well as maybe speak their language or speak uh, address speak to them the way they need to be they want to be connected with or kind of work out a way to to bring this empathy to uh, to to how they are feeling or maybe have them be able to share their feelings uh, so it sounds like you're kind of like struggling in this area of what to do yeah so when you when we together we all together work on the leaflet and the video and whatever probably i have to bring about some changes because i want it to be very close to their way of thinking to our way of thinking but i'm not a very typical greek person because i have studied and lived abroad for a long time so i'm affected by other mentalities while other people are not so i have to decode the message and bring it closer to what they want to listen otherwise they're gonna reject it and i don't want them to do that because i know that empathy will really help them okay so it's like you've lived abroad you've kind of gathered these different ways of thinking and in these different ways of being but you're really wanting to be able to connect uh, with uh, with the with people in Greece uh, and their way of thinking, and take what you're learning about empathy and translate it into a way, or decode it in a way that they can sort of understand and will work for them. And so that's right. kind of what you're you're working on. How do I translate this into a way that will reach them? And 
Yes, and if we try to, if we try to, once we <laughs> we talk about a culture of empathy, we this means that we gone, we want to communicate this, the beauty of this concept and way of living to every 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 person, every nation. So, how are we going to do this uh, for uh, Swedes, where they I live there, and their culture is very different. So cultural elements should be taken very seriously if we want to have good results. I mean, mm -hmm. very different code. And I'll tell you this, when I read the way we, we write an email is so different. The first, in the beginning, when I started receiving emails from American nationals, I said, oh, not very polite, but it was polite for you. However, how, the way we write, Greeks, how Greeks write is more detailed more words, more, more feelings. While Americans tend to be, I mean, the, the, they use shorter sentences. So this have a different effect on the reader and we have to remember that. Yeah, so every culture is different uh, and has kind of a different way of doing things. And an example is, is uh, when you see emails from America, they're short, direct, to the point, no feelings. And yeah. that's one way, and you think, yeah, we, and then whereas we're from a Greek person, it's, it's longer, more words, more feelings, and that's maybe a more sense of connection for a person in Greece. If a person from Greece gets an email from an American, it might feel cold and, and not caring, whereas if there's more feelings, you know, more space, and they feel like more of a sense of connection. And that's going to be true for every culture is going to have a different sort of a language of what, what kind of works for them. And then how do you translate this empathy work into something that works for all these different cultures, sort of a universal, is there something universally that we can do that will translate into what, you know, that will speak to them? Definitely. Yes. Thank you very much. I feel fully hurt. Okay. Um, what are we going to do now? I get I have 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, what do you have anything you want to do? To... Do you want to see, do you want to share some more things about the leaflet? Because I'm not sure when, I mean, uh, if you want me to be online for three hours, I might not make it. I can stay with you for another 30 minutes after a session, but before, the, not today, but I mean next time, because um, um, I have classes before our meeting on Monday, oh, uh -huh. regularly. I have classes before, so I, don't ha I can't stop the class. Next Monday, I might be away. I don't know. I'll let you know if I am. Um, and then on the 20th, I'll be back to work. So if you want me to stay for another 30 minutes on Monday the 20th, uh, I can do this. Uh, and if you want to tell me, if you want to tell me a few things about the leaflet, uh, I could gladly hear what you have to tell me. Or if there is something else you would like to let me know. Or if you want to practice empathic listening with me for a few 15 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, going into, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, thinking of the, 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 uh, the introduction, I think it's just a matter of uh, doing the, uh, just, just if you do during the week, do an empathy circle with your students and then report back, that's already a lot right there for the, uh, so that, that's a contribution right there to the, to gathering experiences and testing, right? Testing with your students. Uh, it sounds like uh, the three hours would be too much. So I think this two hours that we have here with, you know, Stefan and Ingrid and the four of us is kind of the primary, most important for us to keep that going. And then if you have extra time for the other, you know, if, if, however, then that's... You mean after our meeting? Uh, we do it before the meeting, but you say you have a class then. Yeah. No, I can't. Yeah. Uh, I always have classes on Monday. So, yeah. uh, okay, I can try to do this, but after Monday the 20th, because I'm on vacation, I will not see right. my students. 
I feel yeah. I can try to do it's not very easy now because it's an English class but I will try to I mean uh, once we practice uh, uh, their, uh, we, they practice the spitting skills I will just uh, give them something a different exercise so uh, I'll try to do it uh, okay so it, you didn't do a real empathy circle with the students where they one person spoke and the other reflected back no, I did the exercise with a statement. Okay, yeah. I think that's a harder, that's a harder one maybe. It, it, I think that the core would be, uh, I guess we could think about how to do it in your class. Could you have, you need a topic like a, you know, like a, a positive sort of a topic would probably good be, would be, I don't know, what's a, a good, topic um we should get a list of topics together for oh that's not a problem edwin uh -huh. because i i share many videos with them with social issues uh, inspirational issues and so we have many things to discuss i can choose one mm -hmm. and uh, i can just explain that today we're gonna do this and this you're gonna talk and i'm gonna reflect and i'm gonna speak and you're gonna reflect so uh we can uh, i can do it the the topic will not be a problem I okay think. well a personal one like uh Tell us about growing up in your family. You know, the childhood one is, is pretty good because it's personal. And so people talk about their personalness. So something like that, but whatever. Yeah, I just, so, but then how, how would you introduce it to them? Like, how do you, you would like model it or how, what, how do you envision kind of bringing it into the, I will, uh, I think that I'm brainstorming. I think that I will try to connect it to their everyday life. And we're going to practice today something you can use with your friends and your boyfriends mm -hmm. and girlfriends, whatever. So let's try to see what we really listen when somebody uh, speaks to us. So I'll tell you something and I want you to tell me what you heard. And then, you know, I will do something like this for a minute, then for two more minutes. Because I have to, this will be part of the English class, so I have to keep some balance, you know, and I always try to keep them very happy and excited. So I think I can do it with uh, most of them. And also there are private classes. I'm a private teacher, so oh. uh, I, I mainly have a private class or a class of two people. Uh, so it's not a big group, but I can do it. Oh, okay. I can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you, you have the flyer. It's, uh, let me just bring that up. That was uh, uh, the share. So this was the flyer. Oh, yeah, I have seen right? that. Mm -hmm. So this is the flyer, and it's just, you know, printing it out and giving them and reading it together. So in a circle Excellent. of three, mm -hmm. three to five, and that is found in our kit, your toolkit under empathy circle. So if you go to the, our website, the toolkit, it's under yeah. empathy. Could you send me the link? Is this the one link you have already shared with me? I think so. That's the one in the chat window, if you want to bookmark that. Oh yeah, I can see the file, but what is the, how to host an empathy circle? Uh, so that's a web page that there's a web page with a more detailed and you know bigger instruction bit of an in introduction and uh, It's more a little bit more extended Web page and then the other one is like a PDF that you can download and the PDF you can print and then Easily print and give to people so they have something in hand where is the PDF? Ah, oh, okay, okay. I guess at the top of it. Okay, I saw it. Uh -huh. It's under step one. Yeah, design, okay. written material. So this is what we're going to be doing. We already have step one done is design. And then the next step is going to be to design a slideshow. And you can see the rough draft of the slideshow is step two. Oh, we're not on the PDF now, right? We're back to the page. Oh, yeah, if you, I can. Uh, you mean uh, two slideshow of basic empathy circle? Uh-huh, so, yeah, how to, exactly. So that's the PDF, so I'm, 
I'm sh that's this one here. I don't know if you're seeing the screen or shared screen. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is the slideshow. So that will be, that's what we're working on. We're, we're kind of doing brainstorming and you can actually open that one and actually edit it. So we can all go in and try to, it's going to take a minute to load all the different slides. It, this is just a very rough draft to show how an empathy circle works. You know, have some pictures, some diagrams, and then some samples, and then we'll narrate it and have a whole, you know, this whole, uh, and okay. then we create the video, and then we maybe create an animated version of it. So those are the steps. Okay, let me check that I have the right page. Okay, open, yes, this, and create a video introduction and animated version. Okay, so I could just uh, uh, take a look at the slideshow and bring about some changes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the first thing is, is really though to test out the, 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 the PDF. You can download that and test it out, see how it works, and see how does it work with your students. You know, what is it? That they what struggles do they have or what what is the experience um, okay I can do it I will uh, I will uh, underline the meaning the um, the value it has for their everyday life so yeah people, people like it when they connect what they learn to their lives mm -hmm. so one thing I always wanted to ask you was um, have you studied anything because I don't know anything about you. I mean, I know that you told us that you started from a family where, you know, you wanted to do something about good connection. And probably you had empathy in your family. But did you, have you studied anything or, <laughs> okay, have you studied anything or? Well, I have a degree in economics. Okay. So I, from, I went to... I went to a lot of different schools. I went to Sacramento, they have a Sacramento State. I was at UC Berkeley one semester and San Francisco State one semester. Then I went to the University of Hamburg for one semester, studied Indonesian language. And then Hamburg, I spent Germany. Hamburg, Germany. Yeah, I have German citizenship, so, and speak oh, gee, German. Oh, I've been yeah. there. Oh, yeah? I lived in Hamburg, yes. Oh, really? For how yes. long? For six months. Okay. That's probably a couple Altona. of years, uh, but in Altona, I lived in Altona. Altona. Okay, uh -huh. I was near the university, you know, Alster. Near the... okay. okay, and then I went for half a year on a field study program to Indonesia. You know, we studied you know geography and culture and stuff, and then another. Then I went back to Hamburg for another half a year, and then I went to the University of Texas, where I ended up getting a degree in economics. And then I came back to the Bay Area and just kind of on my learn on my own learned computers. So I bought computers and so I became a computer system administrator. So I could set up computer networks for businesses. And I worked oh. in you know, that I was sold computer. I I worked yeah in the computer field for for a fair while. But because I'd done all that traveling but before university, you know, I spent like eight, ten years, you know, traveling and, you know, in all the different countries. So then I had that kind of seeker kind of part of me. And then uh, I wanted to go back to that more something, you know. And so I started doing some documentary work when I was in the computer field. And then I came across empathy. And I thought, oh, this is really an important value. And so I just started learning about it and working with it. So just kind of on my own and started doing interviews. So it's like 300 interviews with, you know, all the experts I interviewed. And but have. how did the, why did these people uh, um, accept? I mean, the, why did they want to give you the interview? How did you introduce yourself as what? Well, it was, well, first, yeah, I was working, I created a website for empathy, the culture of empathy.com website. So it was the biggest, it was all these resources on empathy. And then it was early in the, with the video, 
online conferencing. So people were really, it was so new, people were willing to try it. And then I started interviewing so many well-known people that it just everybody else would see, oh, you already interviewed all these well-known people. I'm glad to do an interview too. So it just, you know, all the scientists, the academics, the educators, the artists, the writers. So it's just, it's easy. Not, not everybody sends me books and they all, you know, I interview, you know, William, you know, Miller, and then I've got another. This guy just sent me his book. Oh, brown gold and power of kindness. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah, so cool. why empathy is essential in everyday life. Yeah, just give me a second to write down. The power of kindness. Okay, Goldman. Okay, thank you. So he is in Toronto and he just wrote this book. So he sends me a copy. I'm going to interview him in two weeks. Uh, next week, there's another book. Um, so I just interviewed this person, so he's a designer, he has applied empathy. And if you go to the cultureofempathy.com website, you can see all the interviews or I'll just scroll okay. down the page. And then he sent me a book. I'm going to interview him next week. Oh, I'll meet you there. Okay. This is from the NBC guy. It says, A Practical Guide to Empathy, Mindfulness, and Communication. Can you just show me the name again? Because it's a little difficult. Shanti... Gar ba. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then this is another one. I'm interviewing him in a, in a, I can't remember when, but. What's the name? I can't see the name. Choosing Peace uh, by uh, Ike Lassiter. Okay. Yeah, but okay, but uh, I mean, in the beginning, when people didn't really know you, you just called an uh, academician, a professor, and said, Hi, I'm this person, I would like to take an interview. And they said, Yes, I mean, were they willing to give you? Oh, okay, that's very good. Yeah, but I interviewed a few famous academics, and then the other ones say, Oh, he already interviewed him. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> and then uh, now okay. there's so many that. Everybody just says, oh, Edwin interviews everybody. So they just are yeah, open okay. to it. I understand. But it seems that you spend a lot of hours on this. And I mean, you said that you're a pensioner, right? I just, yeah. Okay. So you have a, a kind of income that can, you, just, you can survive on this. Uh, but um, Yeah, I need to do, that's what I want to do, the training. I've done some workshops, some listening, some mediation. Uh, but I'm wanting to do training, so I'm trying to get the training together to do more workshop training for income. So that's kind of like the number, that's like a big project. Okay, but for you to do this, doesn't this mean that you have to provide a certificate that you have to be, you have to have an institution certified and in a position to give a certificate to other people? I mean, how are you thinking about this? Yeah, it, America is not quite so. I mean, Europe, Germany, for example, everything is certified. Everything you do is certified. It's a bit looser here. Oh. You know, it's not so, you know, people can hang up a shingle and just start a business. It's not as difficult. It's not as controlled, I think, as Europe. So that's the kind of issue that here. So... Um, I mean that if you want, let's say that you organize a workshop, uh -huh. and you charge it for fifty dollars, one hundred, whatever. Let's say right. for somebody to pay for that means uh, um, means that the person also wants to be certified. I mean, prove that you know I pay this money and I learned this and this uh, this knowledge comes from this person, from this institution, from this something. Uh huh. 
uh, how, I mean, Coursera, for example, when we attend a class there, a course there, we have a badge, we have something. We say, yeah, okay, I paid for this, I did this, and now I can just apply this uh, knowledge in my professional life. How are you thinking about this? How are you going to um, organize your first uh, workshops and ask people to pay you for that? You know, most of the workshops here, there, there's, there's workshops that people just say, here's this workshop, people take it, and that's it. There's no certification. So that's sort of the most basic. Uh, there's another form of certification, which is continuing educational units. You have a certain level of training, and it gets certified, and then people get credit. So for nurses, you know, educators, they need to take a certain amount of they call them continuing education units uh, then, and I'm not quite sure of the process for getting that. There's a certain standard for it that I haven't, I, it would be good to have that, but I'm, you know, the first level is just do the workshop, people pay for it, and then, uh, you know, they just have the experience. But, you know, everything that we can added, CEUs or some certification, some larger program would all be good to have. But the, the, the first step, I think, is just holding the workshop because people kind of want the, want the knowledge, the experience, or the practice. Yeah, I understand. But if I, if I attend a workshop and pay for that, how am I going to mention this to my CV? I attended a, a workshop on empathy offered mm -hmm. by whom? Edwin. Yeah, Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. Okay, Center of, okay, that's, this is how you describe your, okay, company, organization. Right, uh-huh. Oh, okay, now I understand. And could you also be, I mean, could you also give these credits to, uh, uh, as part of a lifelong learning process, could you give this credit to other professionals? Let's say that I'm an educator and I need, I'm an American citizen, I'm an educator and I want these uh, extra credits uh, to add them to my CV. Uh, could you offer this in the future? We could. Uh, oh. You know, we'd have to develop it so that we can have, they call them CEUs, right? Oh. The continuing education units. There's a specific oh. term. And some classes have it and they have to meet certain requirements so we can design it for that, which then means health professionals and educators will want to take it. Because if you're in the health field or in the education field, you're, it's sort of like a requirement to have these CEUs every year or two. You got to have some continuous education units. So that's one thing we could do. The other is we can also have our own certification we can create our own empathy certification. And I'm, I'm not sure how to set all that up, but you know, it's something farther down the line to do. We would create more demand or more, yeah, um, it creates, uh, it creates, uh, you know, people want it, like you say, for their CV, right? They're trying to put together a list of all the things they think they are certified empathy trainer or the, or the certified empathy class that they've done. Then they, it, it, it's on their stepping, you know, the, on the stepping stone for. With yes. Their, uh, because uh, what I'm thinking to do, I don't have the time now this summer, but I would like to organize some workshops and, um, you know, uh, about digital teaching and learning. And also I want to add empathy, which I believe is, uh, I mean, is an absolutely necessary concept that we have to use as educators and uh, but i want to to talk about you and all, all the things that we do all together and to my professors at university or at other companies and i want to to describe it uh, somehow i mean i i mean can, could you give me something that says that yes dimitra has attended uh, 20 sessions five sessions whatever and I am the organization of culture of empathy. How can I, I want to be able to prove it because I might say, yes, I have attended these, these uh, classes, these meetings, but another person might say, I don't know this. You might not tell me that you might not be telling me the truth. Mm -hmm. So I want to have this um, confirmation coming from you officially saying that, yes, Dimitra has attended all this and uh, she has practiced this and this and this. I certify here, not in an official way, but you know, somehow, mm -hmm. so I can prove it. Yeah, 
Well, you can write it up and we'll sign it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I, I, I'll tell you this. I have uh, seen that there is a university. Oh, I don't remember the name right now in New York. And they, they certify uh, empathy trainers, trainers in empathy and all this. Uh, but they might do something different. I don't know what exactly they do. And I want to be a certified empathy trainer. Mm -hmm. Very seriously, I want to do it. Yeah. And um, so I really like what we do because it's the core. Is that we just practice something, you know, in real time. It's not theoretical. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to be able to add it to my CV. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, but I think... I uh, that, yeah, so it's really about having a course that it's like it's a practical practice, but that it's a, a fixed course that you can say, hey, I did this and here's the proof kind yes. of, of it. Yeah. If you uh, think I can help you with this, I would be yeah. very willing to do that. I mean, uh -huh. how, how we can organize a course, I mean, just the steps and all this, and we're going to uh, number the sessions and the level one will yeah. uh, include this, uh, this number of sessions and these will be the skills that each participant should be in a position to practice after the completion of the sessions and then level two and this. Now, uh, I would be, I would love to, to do that. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, because we do need that. Uh -huh. the, uh, it, it, would add up, it would give, uh, it would, I think it would draw a lot of people because people are busy and they want to be able to add it to their resume and it's, it's a nice thing to say. They go to a business and say, hey, I'm certified empathy. Yes, um, that's what we'll have a goal, you know, mm -hmm. so we can just uh, gather together. We come up with a brainstorming, choose the best things, and we just, through trial and error, we make it better. So let's say that the next season from September to, uh, from September to May or October to May, we're going to run level one and we're going to certify people. Mm -hmm. So the, the organization will certify these people on this and this and this. This means that you have to practice empathic listening for 50 hours. Right. Um, do this and this and this. I don't know. We have to discuss it. And we say, okay, we'll start with this. we see how it goes. And next uh, summer, if all goes well, we just come up with the feedback and we say, you know what, we're going to keep this and this part, but we're going to change the other two because it seems that they were not very useful. People didn't yeah. like them. Yeah, it sounds good. That's, uh, there's, there's no real empathy. No, there's not a good online empathy training that I know of. There's a, there's a lot of different types of training that use empathy, like nonviolent communication, you know, with Marshall Rosenberg's. There's a lot of empathy in there, but it's, it's uh, they're very, you know, they have their own thing, NBC. There's uh, motivational interviewing, which Bill Miller does. You know, it uses empathy. Uh, there's a lot of different practices. There's focusing. I should actually put a list of all the different organizations that are sort of built on empathy. You know, there's a whole bunch of organizations they have their own kind of like certifications and, and yeah. stuff but there's not that first piece like a real focus on empathy you know a, you know, a deep focus on on empathy uh and i think that's really that's that and that's what stefan said too you know he's you can see he's done a lot of research around all this and yeah. and, and the academic empathy work gets very academic and sort of psychological and analytical, but not the practice, not the relational practice yeah. of it. So that's what, that's what we're trying to get is that first, you know, part that's very practice oriented and, you know, getting more into the feelings, you know, articulating feelings and sharing the feelings and, you know, very experiential too. So I, I see that as central, that felt, that felt experience component. And Ingrid was talking about it too. We were both talking about it. So I think we have that, you know, really in common that what are exercises too that people can do to tap into get better aware and practice, you know, articulating their feelings. So 
uh, it seems that we have the most important part, which is the core, mm -hmm. and we have to just add the other components all around it. So once you need more money, which is okay, fair, once you spend all this time preparing all these groups and blah, blah, I think that we are not far away from uh, uh, organize it in detail and just give it to the market, keeping the quality the, uh, the way it is without making any discounts here. Mm -hmm. And so we say that we can just come, come, uh, come up with the main, um, how can I say, uh, we have to decide on the details. Okay. Level one, how many sessions, what are the, what are the skills and then that we're going to practice and then we just give it to the market. Mm -hmm. You know, people will just join you and they know that every session will be very well organized. We're not just discussing about this or that. And it seems that the last the last sessions we have together are better organized. So I, I had also told you about this a few weeks ago, which I really liked it. So I think that you can, I mean, uh, we can um, I, I strengthen our presence and you can have the money you need and the money can go back to the organization and uh, or, uh, making better events maybe or you can use the money the way you think and also people who join us will be certified mm -hmm. so, yeah. uh, i don't know about uh, what is really needed uh, for you to uh, give this uh, c c use yeah c use uh, I don't know how is this for you to look for that and the, the requirements and we can go for that. So, I mean, after September, we can just plan it, organize it and start. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Continuing education is units. Um, what is, I mean, do you want, do you have to contact the Ministry of Education? I don't know how things are in the States. No, I don't remember the process, but it's all on the internet. You just okay. research. So I'm kind of like focusing on the training part now first, but that's, yeah, I'm in, want to get that going as soon as we can. So I think that's good. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think we're almost through the, through the book. So it's yeah, good to get that going. Yeah, because I think that people might feel that we are not very, uh, how can I say, that we are a little uh, freestyle thing and, you know, not very serious and, we, you know, we just, uh, we we miss some, something is missing here. So if we add this component, then everything will be fantastic. You have an amazing mm -hmm. idea. You invest yourself in this. We give whatever we can we give to you and to the organization so why don't you make it why don't we make it more official mm -hmm. just, then you will feel better okay yeah that's that sounds great and you have you can kind of contribute to that structure too kind of help definitely the yeah structure. of so, course yeah, uh -huh. so. yeah and okay great okay. so then let's do that no that that sounds good i think we're had a good um okay what's the next step what do you think is the next step? I mean, till, till next Monday, uh, would you like to look for the CEUs? Do you want us to brainstorm on something? Come up with a few ideas. How could I help you with this? Um, I don't know. What do you think? You're, you sound like you have a good sense of the structure. I tend to be kind of free form floating. So um, it sounds like you're better at the kind of that structure. Um, I mean, I can look up I CEUs. I think that we have defined the number of sessions, uh, the skills practiced um, in every session. Uh, we have to um, divide uh, every session into smaller parts and uh, have pre-decided on what we're gonna uh, work on. For example, we start, let's say, with, uh, with uh, two minutes of um, calming down. And then Edwin, I mean, or the instructor will just uh, introduce something, uh, let's say the topic, and then we start reflecting, or we say we start with a, with a chapter of the book. So we have a clear structure. We have some steps, this and this and this. And then um, after we come up with every single step, we move on to practicing empathic listening. And maybe we could just, in order to, to check the improvement after each session, 
we could ask participants to reflect by sending us a paragraph by, I don't know, we'll have to think about it, but this will make them realize that this is a serious thing. It's not mm -hmm. just something that, oh, you know, I don't have anything else to do. Okay, let's join Edwin. No, it's all like this. So it's something serious and we want to see the improvement. And if we see that, okay, what we're gonna do if some people are not very serious? If some people, um, well, it would be paid. So when people pay for something, they get a little bit more serious too. You think so? Oh, okay. Or maybe I'm wrong, you, you know, from, I think a little bit more. Yes, okay, okay, you're, you're right. But you know what? What if uh, we also have to think about how we're gonna deal with people who might be a little more, they might disturb the team, they might not collaborate that um, um, uh, um, in a very harmonic way, very good way. But I think that the main thing is just to write down every single step. Mm -hmm. And then we decide on the sessions. I mean, you know better. I mean, uh, after you think after 12 sessions, 12 two hour sessions, you think that somebody have practiced enough empathic listening so as to um, have a kind of better everyday discussion with colleagues and family members? Yeah, well, I think part of it would be is that they, they, they do homework too, that, that the, the creating, it's the, you know, the first couple sessions you're, you're learning and practicing, but then to be constantly practicing uh, with your family friends like Stefan was you're doing it with your students and then you report back and then you Get feedback and comments and then you go back out so that there's a you know a community practice aspect to it Okay, and also what about reading some things because um, I mean you have so many books and uh, what if we just use some expert excerpts you know and ask people to to study you know because all the courses have some some reading as well so what if we say that in session one we, we want to take a look at this and this except for the book because the book is just very i mean if we if our if these workshops are for professionals then people should just do a little more serious job i think and they could just uh, read some scientific text or i don't know what else but i think that some serious reading would be a good idea hmm. i don't know how you think about how do you find my idea hmm. that's a, yeah that's um well this is in terms of actually practicing your listening skills it has a, it has a, it's, it's kind of the easiest book I've seen for, for that. If you're talking about more academic work, there's a lot of videos, but that's, a, that's a different sort of a focus. Um, that's more kind of the academic, uh, didactic aspect of, of, uh, you know, you're, you're reading about the neuroscience or, or the biology or about, uh, attachment theory or or that kind of stuff that's that's kind of more of an academic understanding of the science neuroscience psychology versus the actual practice because I think that like Stefan he is really seeing the need for the practice it's that's what what, what, what we're doing um, no I, well, I didn't really have this in my mind I was thinking about, let's say, giving a story or an incident and ask, written in a short story, oh. and ask people to uh, interpret. I mean, maybe giving a, give a, they might give a different ending or, you know, just a comment on the story. It's not only about empathic listening, but it's also empathic reading, you know, because empathy just how I... Um, I practice empathy in whatever I do. So when I read something, what do we, do I really understand? We can we can see this and we can include in the classes or we might say we can leave it for now. We can use it for level two. I mean, we're just, mm -hmm. we're brainstorming right now. Right. Um, empathic listening, it is important, definitely. And we need the practice, but I don't know if some reading would help as well. But we can see that. Yeah, that's a good question because... It was in our Saturday group, 
we have uh, two people who are very experienced in this motivational interviewing. They actually do trainings in it. And so uh, one of them, Denise, she took over the, the facilitation and she actually did like three chapters at once. And she kind of integrated it and she, and we have it recorded too. So it was talking about more of our personal experience. And then uh, I can't remember the topic. Um, it was talking about something personally and then she wanted to model it. So she asked one of the, he said, who would like to share sort of a conflict you have? Because, because motivational interviewing is about a conflict in your life. And so one of the people said, well, I have a conflict in my life is that when I get upset with my, with my partner or my family, I lash out in anger with them. And so she just did listening about that person's anger and how she said, I don't really want to have to be relating with, you know, lashing out in anger. I'm trying to develop more care, you know, with my family and with my partner. And she talked empathically about that while she just got empathic listening. So she was able to move into a personal conflict and kind of surface and explore the conflict. And, it was, and she was just very grateful for the space to do that with. So, um, so those are, grateful. she was, yeah. And so it's very much into, the, if we can share personal stories, like, like uh, our Wednesday group is going to be on fear. Like how do we face fears? So what is a fear or anxiety that you have? So, and then sharing those is very relevant because you're talking about something very personal. So there's sort of a spectrum of very personal, you know, addressing a personal issue to something more kind of academic. And like this book is somewhere in between, like we say some academic, some personal, and, but you can get very personal. And so I'm not quite sure of the, which is the, the it's, it's more fun. The personal is definitely more alive and, you know. Yeah, but okay. However, some people might have a difficulty with this, but yeah. I think that if we keep the topic, let's say that we talk about phobias next uh, Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessary for me to <laughs> say that this phobia is mine, but I might talk about phobias I, uh, unless I feel comfortable enough to say, yeah, you know what, this is my phobia. So, because you don't know, especially at the beginning of the sessions, people, you know, are totally strangers and they might not feel very comfortable, yeah. but we check, we see. The instructor should check how people feel and just decide accordingly. But I think that a topic, having a topic is a good idea. I, I don't want to clarify that I didn't talk about academic texts or scientific articles. I'm talking about situations that might be written, you know. All oh, right. I, I, write, I read something and I comment on this and say, you know what, Mary, I think that wasn't very empathic because of this and this and this. Right. And she could answer like this. Uh, it's more uh, of a narrative, more of a story yes, in how right. looking at the story. So there's that kind of aspect too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I kind of personally like the the personal part of it, but not going into difficult. You can start with what's like that. The book actually has some good questions. Like what is the story of growing up? Like what was your experience? So always starting with positive you know, not going into the deep pains and fears to begin with. They start with finding a, engaging stories, personal stories that are about positive. What is the most inspiring moment of your life? You know, okay. when, when was the most, you know, it, it's those positive stories or what is the struggle you've had? What, you know, there's, so there's a way of doing a, a personal going deeper into the personal, but doing it in a gentle, slow way before you get into the more difficult conflicts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, this makes sense. And also, I, I just thought about the following thing, uh, that if you want to offer some workshops, then you have to choose your partners, right? Unless you run all the workshops by yourself. So you have to say, 
I'm going to charge this and I'm going to find one, two, five other strap facilitators and I'm going to pay them this and I'm going to not pay them that. Or I don't know, whatever you want, you would like to do. So you have to come up with a kind of business plan right. where you just, have the details because we when it comes to business of course we have to decide on every single detail otherwise we're gonna fail uh, but you know what i'm very uh, optimist because i see that we have the we have the main product the main service which is of high quality so we just need the technical details now to make people um um express their interest in it mm -hmm. now if you want if you are ready to uh, start in September or maybe in January, this is, you know, you know your life and your, what you do, how, how free time you have, how much free time you have. But I think that we can easily do it. I think that uh, we are much closer than what it sounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm good for starting as soon as we can, so. Okay. Yeah. Is that, that was my plan too, to start kind of go through this book, kind of try it out. But there's quite a toolkit, a bunch of resources, uh, a lot of experience, a lot of connections, a network getting built up. And um, you know, I think uh, workshops could be done online with a group, you know, a small group to begin with, like in yes, Zoom. online. And we just, yeah, so it, uh, it could get started, you know, fairly soon. Uh, uh, what I would like us to do is what I have suggested already is that I would like the topic, for example, I would like us to uh, share a video or just, uh, I don't know, a piece of news or something. And we reflect on this. We talked about, we talk about this. And why am I saying that? Because quite often I've seen that, okay, I'm quite talkative as a person and usually have many things to share, but not all people are like me. And many times I've seen that maybe uh, Ingrid or Stefan, I mean, they, they just say, oh, uh, really, you know, I don't know what to talk about. So if we had a topic, if they had watched the video or something, it might have been easier for participants to talk about something. Thing. or if they want to talk about something personal they should do so I think it's good for people to have a number of options mm -hmm. to choose from okay well we have had multiple options so we do have the topic of the book has been the topic so you're you're sort of reading about listening and then talking about the listening and doing the listening as well so you get sort of that academic as well as the, and then you can always talk about whatever's live in you too, which is whatever is personal. And people have done that. Yeah, but it seems that uh, it doesn't work like that because the book has some, let's say, guidelines, but it doesn't talk about a topic topic. It talks about strategies and steps and ways of thinking. So that was my suggestion. We can do it or we might not. Mm -hmm. So you like some, you think something uh, more like a, like a talk like about abortion or wearing the hijab, you know, the, or yeah, like I mean, a story, something. personal stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be something from the uh, something from the news. For example, uh, I haven't shared with you a video about. Um, male sensitivity and how males are raised in the states have i shared this with you uh no no i can share it with you okay. so uh it would be very nice because it's a the lack uh, lack of empathy that makes a i can find right away i think that makes a man uh, feel very distant and afraid to um express their feelings Oh, yeah. It's the mask you live in. This is from a documentary. This is part, I mean, I have discussed this with my students many times. So I'm just uh, sending this here in the chat box. Uh -huh. Okay, so you can, it could be something like this. I think, you know, I think when we start a new project, for me, it's always a good idea to go through trial and error. So we start with a small scale plan. We see what works, what doesn't work. And then we just uh, redefine the next goal and all this. I mean, that, that's my way. Mm -hmm. 
instead yeah. of saying, you know what, we're going to do this for the next two years. But we don't know about the people, the reactions. Yeah, and so you kind of just test things out, try them out and test it. Yeah, well, that's what we've been doing is sort of testing out this book and seeing how this works. And um, mm -hmm. so the other thing is test out. Uh, a topic like uh, you're saying masculinity the other one you, you had some others too videos you sent that were kind of interesting before oh yeah with a uh, <coughs> bell oh yeah yes I don't know if you watch them uh, Ingrid did I mm -hmm. didn't have the chance to ask her about the special needs in pe people with special needs in Kansas and all these they are nice things I mean because you know what? It's not only the discussion that might last for two hours. It's also that all these images and ideas stay in people's mind, you know, and make them think in a different way. Because most of them might have never practiced empathy um, at this great extent. So we motivate them emotionally. Yeah. This is what I do with my, with my class. I just make my students think and come back and say, you know, Dimitra, this video and this thing made me think, blah, blah. So we have a discussion. I use, I use it for discussion, but also to cultivate emotional intelligence in them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's well, yeah. Well, that's the thing to explore. I think that the personal one is the most, it's like getting into people kind of exploring their inner you know, conflicts and dilemmas and insights is kind of the most powerful, like, like you were sharing, yeah, but that, that can become a gateway, those videos and stuff becomes a gateway to that. So I think it's just, yeah, just testing, it sounds good. I, I'm not clear on, I, that's what I'm trying to figure out is what is the most effective way of, of doing this? You know, I, I don't quite have the answer yet. I know a lot of different things, but I don't, but it could, then again, it could be different communities. You kind of speak to them different ways too. And right. if you take one approach, it's going to bring in one community. If we do another approach, it's going to bring a. And yes. so, and so there's the aspect of what are the potential communities and what resonates. You know, who is what be interested in taking this and the most interested in what, uh, you know, uh, what will speak to them. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect. And I don't know that either yet, quite like, uh, I'm not sure who the, I don't know who the, the market, the clearly who is the most receptive market right now for, for this, you know, what is it? Um, so I, yeah, so those are things we need to kind of talk about. And then if you don't know the market you can just start with charging very few dollars or you can start with offering a few sessions for free just the introduction and those who want to who are willing to continue they have to do you know the two or three sessions might be for free you see that yeah and then you say that for the other 20 sessions you have to pay 50 20 i don't know you you have to see but for me it's better to charge low yeah. Uh, and uh, see the reactions and do things, uh, do things mm -hmm. accordingly. So create a quick prototype and then test through the prototype and learn from the prototyping. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think that's the best way too. So, okay, then I can check on CEUs and what did you want to do to your, your, for, for kind of, working on this you want to kind of write up some ideas or some structures or some oh you mean that i can write some ideas for next or, yeah what would you what would be our next step then i just so what do we do between now and the next time we meet um i think that uh, as you said you're gonna see you're gonna take a look at the cec you things and i can just uh uh, make a list, make a word document with some of the ideas, and uh, we discuss this next. But I'm not sure about uh, me joining you next Monday. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, if you make a Google Doc, then you can we can share it too. Yes, definitely. It will be Google, yeah. Google Doc. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. yeah. Then a list, and then we'll just go down the list and talk about the about it, and keep developing with getting a training together that we start prototyping as soon as possible. Yes. Okay. Okay. Cool. okay. okay well then, so, uh, but we'll see you next week for the regular meeting, this meeting, right? Yes, I think yes. Uh, if I